here and thank you everyone for showing up today. I'm just, I wasn't planning on saying anything, just sitting and being a participant, but I'm so happy to see everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this really important session today. So I'm going to be quiet and get out of the way and let Lauren and team do their thing. Thank Fantastic. you. Well, thank all you right. for joining us, Dean Grimes. I know how busy you are. And Brian Evans, thank you also too for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And really, this is um, one of the finest moments for me because I get to work with somebody I've known for 14 years who was my mentee and now is my partner and colleague. And I learned so much from him, um, Pete Malinowski, Billion Oyster Project Director. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the background Pete's going to talk about his background, and then I have a couple questions that I have set forth, but then we're going to turn it over to the audience so that they can be involved rather than us just talking at you. So uh, our partnership kind of formed many years ago, 14 years ago. I met um, Pete as a mentee, and he was working as a teacher at New York Harbor, and we have actually quite a few alumni that are teachers or used to be teachers at New York Harbor. I don't know if they're still there, but that connection was... Uh, the primary focus uh, when we met and it so happens 10 years ago we applied for an NSF grant and received it for five and a half million dollars the biggest grant in PACE history so it's really this is just exciting for me to to have this 10-year mo monument with Pete and the work that we've done because it was it was a real hell Mary when we <laughs> put this proposal in and it, and it worked. And we've had five after that that have been funded. So we have a total of $10.4 million from the National Science Foundation. Dina, uh, Brian Evans is also a part of that work as well. So we try to include all the schools. We have the law school, we have Dyson, we have Seidenberg and the School of Ed all working together. Um, we don't work in silos, everybody's a partner. On the first grant, we had 17 different partners that worked together, everyone from the New York Aquarium to the New York Academy of Sciences to um, everybody that wanted to participate from NPOs and CBOs as well. Um, I'm a professor of STEM. I taught uh, biology and chemistry for 18 years in San Diego prior to coming um, to PACE and I learned how to write grants at that point. And we created partnerships with San Diego State and the high school that I was at. So that was kind of my entree into working with alumni, working with people in the community. And this grant in and of itself is a community-based grant. And it's a grant in which we wanna involve all of New York City. And so it becomes the signature grant for New York City and that the work that Pete does with his team is kind of the cherry on top of everything. And they really have done an amazing job. And I don't want to take away Pete's thunder because I'm so very proud of him. Um, so I'd like to introduce Pete Malinowski from the Billion Oyster Project, the director. All right. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Lauren, for the kind introduction. Um, the uh, Yeah, so we met, as Lauren said, back in 2010. I was a new teacher. I come from a oyster farming background. So I moved to New York City, tried to get into teaching and landed a job at New York Harbor School, teaching aquaculture with um, a really strong understanding of aquaculture and a really weak understanding of teaching. And definitely credit Lauren a lot with our, I think it was weekly or bi-weekly conversations, made me a much better teacher. And um, I really appreciate you for that, Lauren. And then in, um, as you said, in, two, in 2014, we launched Billion Oyster Project. So the original intent there was to take the style of teaching and learning that had been working at the New York Harbor School on Governor's Island and export that to schools all over the city. And we did that because um, our thesis that students learn best when solving real world, world problems and that student work products can have relevance outside of the classroom was bearing itself out at Harbor School. And so we wanted to not only create a pipeline of middle school students to Harbor School, but also get as many young people as possible learning about New York Harbor and experiencing the natural ecosystem where they live. Interestingly, if you go to public school in Maryland, state of Maryland, you're required to learn about the Chesapeake Bay, it's a mandated curriculum. And here in New York City, where we have this amazing history around the harbor and amazing ecology in the harbor, there's no such requirement. So it's highly likely that New York City public school students go through their entire educational, public school educational career without learning the first thing about New York Harbor. And we wanted to change that. So we partnered with Lauren 
and PACE and the partners that Lauren just listed, and we're able to get this National Science Foundation grant. And that allowed us to develop a sixth through eighth grade STEM curriculum for New York City middle schools. And originally, we had a teacher fellowship program where we met, <clears throat> I think once a month, it's a long time ago now, at, at PACE and ran these teachers through a pretty rigorous training process to learn how to implement the curriculum, to prototype the curriculum and give us feedback on what was working, what wasn't, and also do a lot of field-based training. So we wanna see teachers and students not only do this work in the classroom, but also leave the classroom and get down on the water's edge, pulling oyster cages out of the water and getting to interact directly with the animals and the, and, and, and the water here in New York City. And that, that was the start, that was in 2014, and we've been doing various iterations of that ever since. We now work with about 100 middle schools in all five boroughs. Um, we're, we've, we've uh, through, by training teachers, we've reached over 8,000 public school students. We hope to uh, add another 5,700 students this coming, this coming school year, and um, you know, wanna continue making this a reality for as many public school students as possible. And none of this, the, the National Science Foundation grant, the curriculum, the teacher training, none of this would have been possible without our partnership with Pace University and especially the partnership with Lauren. So we're incredibly grateful for the partnership, grateful for the you know, ability to think outside of the box and do things that are you know, not normally done. And um, Lauren's been an incredible partner and Pace has been an incredible partner. And so we're very grateful to that. And you know, we're hopeful that in, you know, that, um, you know, the next over the next few decades, we can get um, all 1,700 public schools in New York City working on Billion Oyster Project activities. Um, so that's my short introduction. Really appreciate you all having me here, and excited to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Pete. So as Pete mentioned, we have um, three different phases that we've currently already gone through with the grants, and it's now kind of been into this computer science component. And ultimately, we have this idea of this um, science center that would be on Governor's Island. So that's kind of the coup de grace and the excitement that we're heading towards in the next couple of years. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But the idea really is to continue this education with students and teachers and grow that even bigger. And so that's been the focus for these last two phases of the grant. So Pete, you mentioned um, one of the things, I, I guess for me, what I'd like to know is um, how did you become such a powerful entity in New York City? Because I've seen you growing when I saw you throughout the first pitch at the Yankee game, I got all choked up <laughs> because I'm so proud of the, the, the accomplishments. And so how do you, what do you attribute um, that success to mostly? Oh, that's kind, kind of you to say, Lauren. The, um, you know, I, I think our, our sort of special sauce um, in the work that we've developed together is trusting students to have take on the responsibility of caring for and restoring the natural world. And I go to, you know, environmental conferences all over the country. And the question is always, you know, how do we, how do we make our movement more diverse? Or how do we find students in public schools to become environmentalists? And, and meanwhile, there's a, you know, group of old white men in a in a dark room deciding what's best for the planet. And the reality is that it's not interesting and it's not effective. And so what we do at Billion Oyster Project is we, rather than tell students, you know, this is, this is your homework assignment, please do it. We say, can you please help us solve these complicated problems? And by giving students that responsibility, by trusting students to be the agents of change in their lives and in their city, that is, um, um, it's exciting and interesting and the students rise to that challenge and are able to affect real positive change in the place that they live. And I think that that is incredibly compelling to a lot of people. Um, but the key is not just, um, you know, giving students a nod, but actually giving students a responsibility and saying that science and research is not something that you have to have a PhD to be interested in, that we're all scientists all the time. And it's a, um, making making that making making that conversation accessible to young people i think that's what i think that's why people think we're cool <laughs> well we know you're cool pete that's it but i think too you know we've always had the same outlook on education which has been that everybody can achieve if they're given a level playing field so what we've tried to do is support the underrepresented populations in new york city and give them the opportunity 
opportunity to have success. Uh, when we started the program, we had a wraparound model where there was a mentorship and some summer programs, um, and some after school programs. And those components of this work allowed for us to incorporate alumni as well from PACE um, and various entities from BOP and the partners. So, you know, going back, I think the original model was always that focus on underrepresented students, but give them the support and opportunities that they need in order to succeed. And um, to me, that's one of the reasons BOP continues to be so successful is the incorporation of, of that population and increasing diversity within STEM um, is also one of the focus of the proposals that we have in place right now. Um, going forward, Pete, I know there's a lot of people that um, are interested. We spoke a little bit about the impact that you've had and we've had together as well with PACE. Um, in terms of teachers and students, I think you said that we'd like to grow that another 5,700 this year. And then um, onward, are you seeing that opportunity to be a possibility in the next couple of years for us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, our, our model has a has always been to create something that um, can replace what teachers are tasked with teaching. So, so we don't want, we do ask teachers to do some extra work to learn our curriculum and, and take these professional developments and uh, become more um, confident taking students into the field. So it is extra work for teachers, but we also, um, you know, want to create something that's attractive to teachers. So the, the goal is not to have this mandated in any classroom, but to create something that's engaging and interesting and elevates the level of teaching and learning so that teachers want to participate. And, you know, our, the, the, our, our, the strength of our brand is certainly relevant in that, the, the experience that students have had. And um, so I absolutely see it as a possibility. I mean, that's what we're, we're, we're counting on, we're planning on, we want, we want to get with to um, interact with as many many teachers as we can. And so I think, yes, Lauren, I think our goals are realistic, are aggressive, but realistic. Definitely. I think we've always, they always said, you're really shooting for the highest mountain, Lauren. <laughs> but, and, you know, and, and you always have your foot on the gas pedal, but I'm like, Dr. Howry, that's the way it has to be in order for us to have the success, right? So you've <laughs> always gotta be inching towards that, the goal line, if you will, um, ever so slightly. Um, in, in terms of some of the deliverables, we've been really successful in terms of the grants in, in achieving um, the exhibit at the New York Aquarium, which is now functional and people can go see. Um, we also have something which is called a digital platform, and Pete and I have been working on that really diligently with also Morgan Stanley, who's been supportive. So we have some, some business stakeholders as well. And so the vision behind education has always been to meld business with the school so that there's a support uh, where people can do internships, externships, get opportunities in STEM, um, and increase their capacity to say, oh, I'm not just a scientist, I'm not just getting a PhD, but that middle level playing field. And that's really what NSF um, shoots for is how do we fill those jobs where there's not a lot of people that really want, that know about it or want to go into it. So something that Pete and I have also done have we have created the opportunity for students to participate in STEM careers. They have panels with, that we show all the time um, for students. And then we also have um, the aquarium where people can go visit and do internships and externships there. Um, Peter, are there other things that, that you wanna highlight that I'm not thinking about at the current time? Well, I think that there's um, you know a few interesting stats that really point to what you're describing. One is at the Port of New York, employs directly or indirectly over 400,000 people. And only about 10% of those people went to public schools in New York City. So that speaks to a sort of dramatic disconnect between public school students and the real in-demand well-paying careers that exist through the port. And those are often STEM careers. Another interesting um, sort of emblematic story in that narrative is that uh, SUNY Maritime is a state school located in the Bronx um, the SUNY Maritime has 100% job placement for graduates and the highest starting salary for graduates of any four-year school in the country. And yet the vast majority of students at SUNY Maritime come from schools upstate or out on Long Island. And so that's another clear example of the disconnect between public school students in New York City and, and those types of jobs. And the, there's a million different reasons that that discrepancy exists that lack of access exists, but awareness is a big part of it. And so students who have experience 
in STEM careers. It, you know, just, just the uh, working as scientists in the classroom or just awareness of, of the harbors of resource, awareness of those careers are much more likely to take advantage of those opportunities. And in a perfect world, you know, in 20 years, SUNY Maritime reflects New York City a lot more than it does right now. That's for certain. And, and I think too, um, something that you and I are constantly working on is this idea of collaboration, increasing stakeholders and increasing the partnerships. And I had a call this weekend from my godbrother who's head of the Port Authority in, in San Pedro, California. And he said, I didn't know you were doing this work. I have some opportunities for you. So really it's for us, right? Not only including alumni at PACE, but growing this project so that it's coast to coast, right? There's no the idea of, of Pete and I creating this model was that it's replicable elsewhere within the United States. And so we have the biggest school district in New York City, supported by the School of Education at PACE. And then these non profits, CBOs, and other entities within New York City that have created what we call this educational model. And so, um, Pete, are there opportunities that you think um, currently exist maybe within the United States? Or for me, it's always even been globally, like how do we replicate this in other parts of, of Europe? Are you seeing that in your work at all? Well, I think um, that's a good question. And I think that we certainly have our work cut out for us in New York City. Um, you know, we're in 100 of 1,700 public schools. We've restored 100 million oysters out of the billion we're hoping to do by 2035. So we still have a lot of work to do here in New York. And there are, you know, but if you expand out to the country or certainly to the world, Lauren, um, you know, estuaries like New York City, where fresh water from the Hudson River meets the ocean, estuaries are the most productive ecosystems on the planet. So more biomass per cubic meter than any other natural ecosystem. And most temperate estuaries are um, used to have thriving oyster populations, and all of them have been destroyed by humans over the years. So this the, the whole concept of restoration-based education focusing on oysters certainly has relevance um, in, in other geographies. And one of the one of the reasons we don't hear about those ecosystems is because 22 of the largest 30 cities in the world are built on temperate estuaries. So places like New York City and Los Angeles, Miami, right? Those are all built in places that used to have thriving oyster populations. So I think there's definitely an opportunity. The, um, you know, I, our, our, our team at Billion Oyster Project, and certainly I am very much focused on making this work in New York City, but the, um, it certainly has relevance anywhere in the world that people live on and near on or near a degraded natural system, which is everywhere in the world. Definitely. And I look forward to that and helping you do what as time comes around that we can continue those partnerships because people reach out all the time. You know, I've heard a billion oyster project. How can I help? Can you maybe just spend a few minutes? I realized that we didn't talk about the importance of oysters only because I've known for so long, but maybe a lot of people on this call don't know why they're so important and, and maybe just spend three or four minutes, Pete, um, describing that piece of it. Yeah. Um, so one, one way to think about it is to think about if you imagine New York Harbor as a forest instead of an underwater ecosystem. So if you imagine that the New York City metropolitan community, 30 million people lived a, all situated around a 200,000 acre natural forest and we cut all the trees down. So instead of a forest, you had a, a flat dirt landscape that was 200,000 acres. That's essentially what's going on in the harbor right now. So oyster reefs function the same way that trees do in a forest. They build the ecosystem. Say, they filter the water just like trees filter the air. They uh, build three-dimensional habitat, stabilize the ground, and they allow, through that, they allow this entire ecosystem to thrive. So we have a system in New York Harbor right now. It's 200,000 acres, almost the same size as the land area of the city that's had the, um, you know, the ecosystem is, is functionally removed. So all the animals are st still exist in the harbor that have always existed here for thousands of years, but they're far reduced numbers. So it's still possible to see seals and dolphins and um, all these cool seahorses, you know, blue crabs, ospreys, peregrine falcons, all these cool animals that used to thrive in New York City are still around. But if we're able to restore that uh, landscape, we, we can support those animals in a far, in far greater abundance. 
So restoring oysters to New York Harbor, you know, our, our vision of a future of New York City is, is walking along Brooklyn Bridge Park or down Riverside Park and looking out on the water and just and seeing you know, flocks of birds harvesting fish out of the water and dolphins breaking the surface and all of these things, which you can still see in New York Harbor, but only if you spend as much time on the water as I do, which most people don't get to do. Um, so we want to make that a reality for everybody. We want New Yorkers to be you know, very excited about the ecosystem here at home. Rather than leaving the city to find nature, we want, uh, we hope that New Yorkers you know, just walk to the water's edge. And be able to conduct the research. So the background too on some of the project is that as a teacher, after 18 years, your four walls get very, very tight. And so it was always for me, what can I do outside the classroom? How can I incorporate, bring the outside to the inside? And so I often talk with my students about this is it's just not, science just doesn't happen in the classroom, it's all around you. And as Pete mentioned, we have the teachers and the students go out and, and collect data, come back to the classroom, analyze the data, and then they upload this to our digital platform where everything's analyzed and there's algorithms and things that do that for them, but the opportunity for students to connect not only here locally, but also globally through the digital platform, sharing information and data analytics and data with other students is, has been super important to us as well. Um, and as a teacher, right, I think um, I see some of my colleagues there, we all know that the, the difficulty for teachers is autonomy and, and not having the ability to bring the outside in. So allowing for teachers to have these opportunities where they can work with their students at the water's edge. I mean, some of these students really hadn't even been to water's edge, you know, that Pete and I have seen before. And so it gets really exciting the first time that they open an oyster. So for me, I just feel like, okay, this is the, just the beginning of an opportunity for something else, whether they go into biology or science or some other you know, entity of STEM, that's okay. Um, so Pete and I will continue to try to do that work to, to allow for students to have that opportunity and to increase the number of teachers that we have access to as well. Um, so I, I think it's, let's see, it's one, almost 125. Um, Philip, did you wanna add a couple questions before I open it to the group? Cause you mentioned that. No, of course. And in the first place, Pete, if you can um, talk a little bit about what you really, what the organization really does with oysters and how, how you repopulate and what is, what is all about. Yeah, so we, we think of, I mean, Billion Oyster Project has three programmatic departments, restoration, education, and community engagement. And all are part of our education work and all are part of our restoration work. So we, we the oyster, the, the life cycle of a Billion Oyster Project oysters starts on a plate at a restaurant and we collect shells from about 50 restaurants in Brooklyn and Manhattan. And um, those come out to Governor's Island. They spend a year out of the water. So any soft tissue or uh, pathogens die before they go back in the harbor. And then, and then with the help of volunteers, we package those shells into reef structures, wire cages filled with um, recycled shells. Those reef structures go into our setting tanks, which are uh, modified shipping containers over at Red Hook Container Terminals and, the, and use those aquaculture tanks, put the reef structures inside, add tiny oyster larvae, by the million, those larvae swim around the tank and attach to the shells. And then each of those reef structure goes from being, um, you know, sort of an inanimate object to being uh, completely covered with live oysters. And then those containers go onto barges. The barges go out to our reef sites and then cranes actually pick the reef structures out and put them on the bottom of the harbor. And that over the last, you know, since, um, since we started, we've, we've restored about 100 million oysters in, in that way. And some of those are on large multi-acre sites, but most are, um, we have a, about eight large sites and then many, many more small restoration sites in communities or the actual teaching cages that teachers who participate in our programs have. Um, so that's the, the, the short story on how we restore oysters. And uh, are there any volunteer opportunities, not um, uh, not only for students, but for you know any New Yorkers who want to join? Yes, we rely heavily on volunteers. We would not be able to do this without our volunteer um, support. And so, um, from you know April through the end of November, we have volunteer days on Governor's Island, five days a week, and 
um, you can sign up for those on our website, BillionOysterProject.org. They fill up fast, but we um, those volunteers are processing shell, building these reef structures, moving our gear around, getting it ready for the setting tanks, and um, building cages that the teachers use. So there's a ton of volunteer opportunities that we absolutely could not do what we do without the help of volunteers. Great, thank you. We'll um, come back to you in a second. Uh, Dr. Bernick, can you um, maybe have a um, quick word about um, other uh, partnerships that the community and the CCAR, Community and uh, Community Action Center for Community Action and Research at PACE is doing? Sure. So the, so the partnerships within, within this grant have all been focused on increasing the number of students and teachers that have the opportunity to work in the field and learn data analytics as well as participate in research for uh, PACE and for Billion Oyster Project. So those are the Billion Oyster Project and PACE are the two primary members, but we have, I don't know, 17 different partners. And as I mentioned, one of the opportunities that still exist that just opened because of the pandemic is the opportunity to work at the New York Aquarium. Um, they have an exhibit there that's a permanent exhibit, which says BOP, which says PACE on it. And it's a wonderful opportunity for kids to go see. It's a lot of fun. The aquarium is really cool. If you guys haven't been there yet, I recommend going. Um, it's, it's fairly small, but it's lovely to see what we have um, here in New York City within our exhibit there. Um, there's also some of the opportunities on the digital platform allow for the deliverables that have come off of this project, as Pete men mentioned, the curriculum that was created for teachers and students exists there. It's free. They can download it. Um, those opportunities exist for my current students at PACE in the School of Ed that they always, you know, so they always want to be a part of BOP. And some of them actually emailed me last night because I got a new group of students and they've already worked with BOP. So Pete's well known. He's very modest, but it's a well known entity within New York City because they have opportunity. They have a lot of businesses that come in and do volunteer days there. So, like he mentioned, it fills up very quickly um, in terms of the volunteer component of that. Um, additionally, you know, prior to these grants, we partnered with um, Spectrum and Time Warner Cable and AT&T and Verizon. And, you know, I think we had another four million from them working with students doing summer camps. So one of the things that PACE does really well is we do the STEM Summer Institute. And I actually listened to the students. <laughs> they do a three minute video of what, what their favorite thing was. And their favorite thing was going to Governor's Island and seeing BOP and, and the operations there and how everything works. So, you know, we used to have opportunities where students would just go and, and go to AT&T and go to various um, even startups within Seidenberg to do new things and experience, okay, what's out there? How do I know? I want to, I don't even know what exists, right? So that was the piece that the students really, really love. And this is students from all over the tri-state, right? Anybody can, can join the summer camp program, but we can only take like 75 and we get maybe 200 applications. So that's the one thing we could use help with is like this summer, the summer institute needs, needs support um, and opportunity because the kids just all wanna participate and learn how to code. So they learn how to do coding and then they create uh, this code for BOP. Um, it's really fun to see them because they, they don't know each other, right? So they come to this thing and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, they're, they're teens. But um, that, that's, I, I think one of the funnest part of my yeah. work is that summer program. Go ahead, Pete. Nope, you go ahead, Lauren. Okay, I yeah, so that, that's, uh, to answer your question, Philip, I think that the opportunity would be like, how can we increase the number of alumni that participate in these programs that the School of Education at PACE is doing with the partnerships, right? For me, it's always collaboration. How can I do more? Um, I did have one final question that I wanted to ask Pete because before we turn it over to the group to ask any questions, um, the, the one piece we've been talking about is public policy and that's why we included the law school in this, Pete. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to know, or I know you're, some of people are working on that public policy piece, and I know you were working with Governor Cuomo to change that. And is there any advancement towards changing policy and doing those things that we really want to do so that your work is more paramount? Um, you know, the, our, our policy initiatives are, more, are definitely more on the, on the restoration side. Um, the, so uh, our oysters are very tightly regulated by state agencies, and, and you know we we need 
in order to put oysters in the water, we need permission from New York State DEC, the um, Army Corps of Engineers, the Port Authority, the Coast Guard, the Department of State, all these different agencies. And it's um, it's a big hurdle to just get permission to put any oysters in the water. And so a big part of our policy push is making it easier to restore native species to New York Harbor, uh, which has been slowly moving forward. Um, we haven't solved that problem yet, but it's becoming a little bit easier. And then um, another interesting policy initiative is that the, the New York Harbor School, which we're still very close partners with, they have a marine policy and environmental advocacy career and technical education track. And those students recently advocated um, to have the NYC ferry accept student Metro cards. So interestingly, because the NYC ferry is a city initiative and the MTA is state run, the Metro cards don't speak to each other. So students who have public school students who get their, their free Metro cards for the subway are you know, essentially den denied access to the NYC ferry system. And it looks like because of the advocacy of students at the New York Harbor School, there's a, there's a chance that that might change. So it's very exciting for us. And we'll open up access not only to Governor's Island, but to you know, that, whole form, that whole transportation network. And you mentioned the New York Harbor School. I mean, they have so many opportunities for students. And as I mentioned, we when I first start, when I maybe when I first met you, there were seven or eight student teachers that were ex-students of Pace. So when you talk about the alumni connection, <laughs> there was quite a few. Um, do you happen to know? Are there any more that are left there, or do you think most of those have have moved on to other opportunities? There's there's definitely still. Um, Teachers at Harbor School who went through the New York City Teachers Fellow Teaching Teaching Fellows Program, mm -hmm. which um, unfortunately I was not accepted into, but I, I, I've I've long since forgiven the teaching fellows. I was able to find my way through a back door into being a public school teacher. Um, but the uh, yeah, so I mean, as, as you all know, the the you know there is a lot of turnover for public school teachers in New York, and it's something that we hope to help a little bit by providing more support for for teachers. And so a lot of those, a lot of that original group has moved on, but there definitely are still teachers at Harbor School who went through the teaching fellows program. Very cool. And last question. So what do you find to be the most rewarding component of your work? And then I'll turn it over to the audience to ask questions. Um, watching students become experts in their fields, 100%, that's always the most exciting. And not just uh, developing a level of fluency with the language that we use to describe you know, the ecosystem in the harbor and all of that, but actually looking out over the harbor and identifying it as something that they have a responsibility for and have a, and benefit from. You know, I, I, I grew up on a tiny little island east of Long Island with unlimited access to the natural world on an, on an oyster farm. And that was fun, you know, a huge part of, um, you know, uh, inspiring me to care about the natural world and um, watching that same change happen to Harbor School students who, or any student that we work with through, through this program who go from seeing the Harbor as something that they're, you know, a little trepidatious around, a little unsure of, to something that they have an understanding of and feel some ownership of is um, incredibly inspiring. I think that's one of the reasons this initiative has been so successful is that the ownership, you know, Murray Fisher was also worked with Pete and creating this entity. And um, we always said that, you know, kids get excited about their environment and having ownership and taking ownership of what's there. It's their harbor, you know? So, so I think that that's a real wonderful fulcrum for them to work off of. Um, so Philip, I'll turn it over to you and allow for the audience because I feel like Pete and I don't usually talk at people. We're always kind of interactive. So I'll turn it over to you, Rath. Sure, I think people can unmute themselves and just jump in with their questions, but I will be, I'll go first. I have a question for you, Lauren, actually. Yes. For this, um, for the, this project and for STEM initiatives in general, are you saying that uh, students from different schools are involved? It's not specifically for the School of Education, is it? Correct. Well, at Pace, so we have over 100 schools in New York City public schools. So we have, I don't know how many teachers, P 250 teachers, I think, have gone through the program, essentially. Yep. And then um, within Pace itself, we have the Dyson School, which Brian Evans is a part of, um, Elmer Mojico is a part of, 
Um, we've had REUs and smaller grants that I've gotten through um, the larger grants to allow for that work to happen in biology and chemistry. Uh, the law school, Hob Law School, Jason Sarneski and his team have been working with us over the last 10 years in public policy and training students and giving un stu um, underrepresented students the opportunity to go into the legal field. That was our work from last summer, which was really fun. Um, to see students, they, they go and present uh, their work and then all of a sudden they're excited to become a lawyer or whatever it is in environmental law. So that's another piece. And then Seidenberg piece, uh, which we've been with for the last 15 years with Dean Hill and his team, um, Christelle Scharf as well, Frank Parisi, they teach the Summer STEM Institute. They do coding um, and create opportunities for students in computer science. So there's a, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of pillars. It's really hard for one person to take it. And I thought, well, if I put that, if I put that graphic up, everybody would be turned off by it. So rather than do that, we just create this inclusive environment where everybody's included and all. I try to work with all schools that I can. Um, I, I love working with people. So, and PICAs too, and that's, that's part of the success. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Pete, and um, question for you. If I, as an individual, want to make any difference for the ecosystem of the harbor, where do I start? Maybe it's not necessarily, you know, committing time to volunteer with billion oysters, but is there, is there anything we can do on the individual level? Yeah, so um, we're, we're, we are, we are accepting any and all donations to Billion Oyster Project. We're a nonprofit, so that's one surefire way to make a huge difference is get on our website and support us that way. But if that's not what you're asking about, the, um, there's a bunch of things. So uh, everything that ends up on the street in New York City that's not picked up ends up in the harbor. So we routinely find um, ev everything in, in our oyster gear that you've seen on the street, you know, little I don't know, a lot of stuff is gross, so I won't say it um, on, on the Zoom here, but um, a, an enormous amount of street trash ends up right in the harbor. And public school students are often the ones to find it and to pull it out. So the one thing you can do is be, be mindful of that and identify the places where that's where you see that accumulating. Um, every time it rains, all a significant percentage of our wastewater, sanitary waste from homes and businesses flows into the harbor. It's a good thing to be mindful about knowing that if you take a shower, wash your clothes, flush your toilet when it's raining, that's going right out into the harbor. Um, the, uh, I think the one of the biggest ways that everyone can have an impact is by telling your friends, telling your friends that they're, that we live surrounded by a really exceptional natural resource that we should be taking better advantage of. You know, get out on the harbor. There's a dozens of free kayaking programs. You can take a subway to a 22,000 uh, 22, acre national park in Jamaica Bay. That is a fantastic place to see wading birds, ospreys, dolphins, bluefish, like all, you can actually see that in New York City. So taking the time to enjoy the ecosystem, spread that awareness to your friends and family is actually, a really powerful way to start changing the culture we have around using the harbor as our dumping ground and instead use you know doing it as something that should be preserved and protected. We also host this um, STEM symposium on Governor's Island in June and we've had up to four or five hundred students come with their teachers and they present their research and their work that they've done in the classroom and that happens I think this time it's going to be June 2nd so anybody can attend that. It's really fun. It's warm then <laughs> as opposed to cold. Um, Pete's unaffected by that, but I am. But anyway, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun and you get to see student work and you get to speak with teachers um, and you get to speak with the partners and everybody that's there. And it's just a really fun day. And that's June 2nd around between 11 and two, I think. So that's another opportunity to participate. And as Pete mentioned, there's also volunteer opportunities for people to work with BOP um, in, in the capacity of helping out and doing various things. I don't know, what do they do, Pete? Do they work with the shells or? Yep, it's primarily, it depends on what's happening uh, uh, at, at that time of year, but the, a lot of our volunteer work is, is processing our collected shell and building reef structures. Um, at certain times during the spring and summer, we're actually working with live oysters as they come through our system. 
Cool. And you can always become a teacher too and come to Pace <laughs> and be a part of the School of Education because um, you know that initiative, certainly there's a teacher shortage. And so we're always looking for that as well. Um, but I think that, did that answer your question, Philip? Oh, you did. Thank you very much. I wanted to um, take advantage of having it here. And maybe if you tell us a little bit more again about the organization, because we know that I don't like, it, it would be very interesting to me to know what is this organization is about, maybe history of the organization a little bit, how it came into existence and how many years ago and why this and why oysters as such. I mean, I, I, you, you mentioned it a little bit that oysters are um, as a, you know, uh, the what uh, wet lungs of the harbor or something, but why not any other, or maybe there are other organizations that do other animals. Well, the, um, let's see. So the original inspiration grew out of New York Harbor School and the founder of Harbor School who uh, Lauren mentioned, Murray Fisher had built this incredible um, school based on the maritime experience in New York City. Um, you know, instilling in students the ethics of environmental stewardship and also preparing them for college and career. Um, and the students were out on the harbor, learning how to drive boats, learning how to navigate, learning how to measure water quality and doing all that. But most of the, the student projects related to that were about minimizing negative impact and dealing with a classroom that was not as clean and abundant as it could be. And so when, um, and so Murray, as the founder of the school, was hungry for a project that could that could get all the students working together to make that classroom, New York Harbor, a better classroom. And uh, you know when when and so and I, I come from an oyster farming background, so that's what I know. And New York City is an oyster city, so. Um, New York City used to be famous for its oysters. People would travel from all over the world to eat New York City oysters. They were shipped all over the world. They were a delicacy and you could have, ev everyone ate oysters in New York City. At one point in the history, our history, um, New Yorkers average per capita over 600 oysters per year. Just to give you an idea of that, um, how much a part of the city that was. And the harbor used to be entirely filled with oyster reefs. So given all that, it's kind of like if we were trying to restore a forest that was filled with oak trees, we wouldn't be using rose bushes, right? We're using the, the native species that used to dominate the eco, ecosystem. Um, so that's why we're using oysters. And then as far as the organization, we started out of a high school classroom, growing oysters and teaching students about aquaculture. And as we were able to get a little, um, you know, we were able to get a little bit of funding to start, you know, think, considering the, you know, Harbor School's oyster restoration program, and it was becoming a little bit of a thing. And then it really was this initial National Science Foundation grant that we, we applied for in partnership with Lauren that, that allowed us to launch Billion Oyster Project as a, as an, as a, as a nonprofit. And so that's what we are now. We're a nonprofit organization. We have about 45 full-time staff, our offices are on, are on Governor's Island. And in addition to the educational work that we've been primarily focused on today, we also do, you know, the, re restore, actively restore millions of oysters a year to the harbor. And we do a lot of community engagement works. So we have exhibits at the aquarium and Brooklyn Children's Museum. We have small oyster reefs and communities all over the city that are access points for neighborhoods that have traditionally lacked access to the harbor to get down in the water and participate directly with uh, monitoring and restoring oyster reefs. There's a couple questions in the chat, Pete. Um, one from Rick Schulman, are oysters a keystone species? Yes, that's, a, that's the shortest answer you'll get today. <laughs> and we know they filter about one gallon of water per hour, is that correct, roughly? Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, you could say 50 gallons a day. Okay. Two, gallon, two gallons an hour during peak times, but they don't filter much at all during the cold weather. So they sort of hibernate. So it's, we average it out to a gallon an hour. Okay. 
And then his second question was, as grape filtering animals, do oysters filter out toxins and microplastics from the water? Yes. Um, that's a sort of a complicated, um, so it, it is sort of complicated. So the, the biggest pollutant in New York City is nitrogen, um, which comes in through um, uh, farm runoff up, up the Hudson River and sewage treatment treatment plants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. You have fertilizer coming into the ecosystem, and that causes a nutrient imbalance. Oysters are very effective at mitigating that issue by incorporating the those nutrients into their bodies and processing. They act as benthic pelagic couplers, so they take nutrients that are in the water column and not available to many to non-filter feeders, package it into little packages and put it on the bottom where it's available to all these fish, shrimp, crabs, and other animals that are not filter feeders. And in that way, they're able to cycle the nitrogen out of the system. And nitrogen's a nutrient, um, so it's not, it wouldn't be considered a toxin, although it does have a, a negative impact on the ecosystem and can cause dead zones and hypoxia and all these other terrible things. So they're active, they actively mitigate nitrogen pollution. Toxins, so things like lead, mercury, PCBs, other heavy metals, those bioaccumulate in oysters like they do in, in all marine species. And yes, they do stay in, in the oysters. And because they stay in the oysters, they'll also stay in the system unless the oysters are eaten by, by you know, a lobster, a crab, or an oyster toadfish, or a blackfish, and then moved on out, out the system. So a growing, I'm really going to nerd out on oysters here, sorry, but a, a growing population of oysters is a growing sink for toxins and can play a role in moving those toxins out of the system. Microplastics are kind of the same thing. You know, you, you can find microplastics in, in oysters. They will bioaccumulate, but they're not going to leave the system unless that tissue leaves the system. We do not sell the oysters we grow. <laughs> yeah. The oysters we grow are poisonous. And it's illegal to harvest oysters from waters that are close to shell fishing like New York Harbor. So us, you as New Yorkers are denied access to the great, to your greatest natural resource because it's contaminated. Um, I'm sorry I think about how, that. How, how we had another question too, do oysters help the resurgence of bald eagle population? Um, <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> of course, definitely. No, the, uh, the, it's a, actually a really cool time to be doing this type of work in a place like New York City because you know, it was 70, uh, 50, uh, my math is off, 50 years ago, the passage of the Clean Water Act, 1972. Um, the, the, the harbor was a real mess before the passage of the Clean Water Act. It was a gross, toxic, polluted place. And many people, many New Yorkers remember you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when the harbor was really disgusting to be near. And the, the harbor now, for the most part, is, is you know, it, it is uh, much, much cleaner. And it's actually swimmable and fishable most days of the year. And what's happened is, you know, in just in the last 15 years that I've been working on the harbor, there's been a dramatic resurgence in wildlife. And there's more whales, there's more bald eagles, there's more falcons, there's more, all of these animals are coming back because the water is finally cleaner. And so, you know, the, I don't think the bald eagles are looking for oysters, but the, the, they're part of this resurgence of wildlife, which will hopefully will only continue. And you saw dolphins the other day. Yep, right? dolphin, dolphins <laughs> hanging out in Newtown Whales. Creek in the Bronx <laughs> River. Incredible, incredible work. Philip, anything, anybody else, any other questions, comments? Yeah, maybe I just okay. out of curiosity, I'm. Uh, um, uh, I was wondering if those um, I've heard of some sort of ships that they sink uh, deliberately, like old ships, and then they build these uh, artificial reefs out of it. Is it has it something to do with this, with the reactivation of the harbor? Not specifically the project, I would assume, but no, but that the same it, efforts. It, 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 it's certainly related, you know, um, any, any fisher, fisher person knows that the best place to catch fish is around structure. So any kind of structure that's rocks, sunken ships, oyster reefs is going to be a haven for fish, you know, any kind of habitat. And so those uh, man-made reefs, whether they're sunken subway cars or boats, or, you know, sometimes oil derricks, they'll just tip over instead of hauling away, will actually 
support a lot of wildlife um, because we've we've removed all of that natural structure from the system. And so what, you know, one of the big reasons we restore oysters is to restore the three-dimensional habitat that an oyster reef creates. And there's many ways to do that. Um, and so that, that you know what you're talking about so sinking ships is a is a viable tool for you know restoring some lost habit, habitat. There's a couple more questions in there, Pete. Uh, how how do you de detox the oysters to make them safe for eating? We don't, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, our our oysters are unsafe. You yeah. can't eat our oysters, but oysters that find a way restaurant or a seafood market come from water that's that's clean. And then, you know, one of the, you know, the, the FDA does a really good job of um, mandating water quality testing and chain of custody for, for shellfish that you can feel really confident eating oysters in a restaurant or from a seafood market because they've um, arrived from water that's, free, that's you know, um, mostly free of things that would make you sick. So our oysters are not safe for eating, but oysters generally are. And I think there's one more. Do you do you, the oysters you grow yeah. then simply expire in place and create an expanding environment? Yeah, so we're dealing with a system that's had that you know, we we used to consider oysters to be functional functionally extinct in New York Harbor, which isn't really a thing because extinction is a very specific term. But the there there weren't any left in the harbor, um, and so what we're trying to do is build the population back to a point where it can grow. The oysters that we restore, um, you know, some, some of them get eaten right away, some of them die, many of them survive. We hope that, and many of them do live long enough to reproduce. And those oyster larvae swim around the system and we see their, their offspring in various places. Because oyster larvae swim around for two weeks, uh, sometimes that's a difficult signal to track. But what we have seen over the last 10 years is um, a you know, dramatic increase in the amount of oysters we see showing up on bulkheads and um, in shorelines in New York City. So that's a very positive sign. And what we hope, you know, we hope to eventually work ourselves out of a job with the oyster restoration if there's enough <laughs> wild oysters. Um, it's the lifespan of a typical oyster. Uh, there's interestingly not really any senescence in oysters, so they'll keep living for a very long time. There's a lot of things that kill them. So the, you know, we say anywhere from five to 15 years is kind of typical, but oysters can grow, can live for far longer than that. Um, you don't see that very often because something will have killed them before they, they either get eaten or some parasite will get them or something like that. But um, the the oysters that used to exist in New York Harbor, um, people, you know, it was common to find oysters that were more than a foot long, you know, big dinner plate size oysters and that kind of thing. Uh, but we, we don't really see those anymore because most of the oysters that are grown are farmed for half shell consumption and no one really wants to eat a dozen dinner plate sized oysters. <laughs> so true. Well, I think we're close to the end of our time. I want to say thank you to Dean Grimes and Desiree from the School of Education, my friends over at Hobbs School of Law. It's been a pleasure to actually actually grow these grants and incorporate all of PACE. Um, Pete and I are always looking for new partners, for new stakeholders, for opportunities for other people to join us. So please reach out to either one of us at any time. Um, it's what we do and what we love to do and, and how do we grow this community. Uh, this grant in and of itself is a community-based grant. It's a research grant, but it also allows for everybody to participate. And that's why Pete and I chose it. So thank you to Pete too. I know how busy he is and I'm so incredibly proud of you to see you, to watch you grow. It's been just a joy and, and, and to create the friendship we have, I'm very thankful. And to Philip as well for allowing uh, this opportunity for us to speak. Um, Pete and I are like go hand in hand. So it's, it's a pleasure to be able to be here with him as well. Thank you, Philip. Thanks thank so much, Thank you Lauren. very much. Uh, thank you for joining. I just wanted to mention that we have our mentorship program at PACE in place for open to any uh, students and alumni and staff members at PACE.edu slash mentoring. And we, with that, um, I will hope to see you all again at our next set of sessions in the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great all day. Right. You thank too. you. Bye now. <laughs> Bye.